Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is David McKnight. I'm the director of the Rare Book and Manuscript Library uh, here in the Kislak Center. I'm also the chair of the Rosenbach uh, Lectures in Bibliography Selection Committee. I'm the chair of that committee. I welcome you all to Professor Charles Burnett's third, and I say this with sadness, third and final lecture in the 2019 ASW Rosenbach Lectures entitled Arabic and Greek Science and Philosophy, Form and Style in the Transmission to the Latin West. At this time, I would like to acknowledge my fellow committee members, some of whom are here this evening. Will Knoll, director of the Kislak Center and the Schoenberg Institute of Manuscript Studies, John Pollock, curator of research services here in the Kislak Center, Dan Traster, curator part-time Kislak Center, Jerry Singerman, senior humanities editor at the Penn Press, Professor Rita Copeland, Penn's Department of English, James N. Green, librarian, the uh, library company, and Peter Stallybrass, retired, Department of English, University of Pennsylvania. It is my pleasure to announce that Professor Michael Suarez, director of the Rare Book School and professor of English at the University of Virginia, will deliver the 2020 le uh, Rosenbach lectures from the 17th to the 21st of March, 2020. So mark that in your calendars and hold the date. Uh, we'll be providing you with further information about titles and so on and so forth. This evening, Professor Ellie Truitt will formally introduce our speaker. Currently, Professor Truitt is an associate professor at Bryn Mawr College, where she teaches medieval history, including courses on medieval science, medicine, and the history of magic, intellectual history, the Crusades, global networks in the Middle Ages, and courtly culture. Her research interests are in the history of science, medicine, and technology. She is the author of Medieval Robots, Mechanism, Magic, Nature, and Art, a University of Pennsylvania press book. Her book can be found <coughs> in my hand and on the table <coughs> opposite the elevators. Please welcome <coughs> Professor Truitt. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here for um, Professor Burnett's lectures and to be able to offer a brief formal introduction. Um, my own research interests, as you heard, overlap with Professor Burnett's, and it is no exaggeration to say that my own scholarly career would be significantly altered or even impossible without his work. As others have already noted earlier this week, Professor Burnett's list of publications and scholarly achievements is so long and varied that it defies abridgment. So I'm just going to take a few moments here to consider the impact of his scholarship within my own disciplines, the history of science and medieval studies. 25 years ago, it was commonplace within the history of science to encounter a narrative of scientific progress that allowed for the medieval Islamic hit world a vital role but a passive one by translating the works of science medicine, engineering, and philosophy from Greek, Persian, and Syriac into Arabic, these translators, as this narrative held, had preserved ancient knowledge until it could be conveyed into Latin and from there be absorbed and assimilated into a Latin Christian framework and then become part of the Western canon. Likewise, in medieval studies, commentator has been the default and ubiquitous sobriquet for those working on the Latin Christian West when mentioning writers such as Hunayn ibn Ishaq or Al-Kindi. As Professor Burnett's work has demonstrated over and over again, commentary and translation are not passive or superficial. They are instead intellectual processes and outcomes that produce new knowledge or that significantly change how one views existing knowledge. Hunayn ibn Ishaq's Isagogai <clears throat> systematized and streamlined the unwieldy and contradictory corpus of Galen. Likewise, Al-Kindi, far from being a commentator, provided the rationalization for how astral bodies influence earthly ones with far-reaching implications for medicine, astral science, alchemy, and divination across Western and Central Eurasia. Since the publication in 1997 of the introduction of Arabic learning into England, Professor Burnett has done more than almost any other scholar to correct these earlier misleading narratives 
about the importance of Arabic science and scholarship on the development of ideas in the Latin Christian West. Additionally, by examining the milieu of translators working in the Arabic and Latin contexts, Professor Burnett has demonstrated the work of scholars like John of Seville and Adelard of Bath, who translated materials across epistemic as well as linguistic boundaries. Finally, by also including texts on divination and magic in his scholarly inquiries, Professor Burnett has also, following here in the footsteps of Lynn Thorndike, Francis Yates, and others, highlighted the extent to which the so-called occult sciences are bound up with Aristotelian natural philosophy in this period. As we think about the work of how translation and commentary become new finished products, um, when, as we listen to Professor Burnett in his last lecture, um, I'm sure you can all join me in taking a moment to think about the work that Professor Burnett himself has done in translating for all of us the importance of this kind of labor for understanding medieval intellectual culture. Please join me in welcoming Professor Burnett for his final lecture of the Rosenbach Lecture Series. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellie. Again, um, you're too kind. Um, <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. I'm, I'm enjoying being in Philadelphia so much I don't want to leave, but um, partly because uh, you've got such a rich collection of manuscripts here. Um, this is not a, f a manuscript <laughs> from your uh, collection, I'm afraid, but it exemplifies, I think, very nicely the um, combination of art and science being um, Euclid's elements, very much uh, scientific uh, uh, work, um, and, uh, but surrounded by all these wonderful little doodles, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, I'm just interested in the science at the moment. This, um, having spoken about the translations and the glosses um, in respect to forms and styles in my two previous lectures, um, today I shall be speaking about commentaries. And as Ellie said, these are not uninteresting pieces of work, but they can also be enormously creative and helpful. Um, in fact, uh, I was rather taken by um, a quotation from Egbert of Liège in the 11th century, who, in respect to commenting on Virgil, said in a neat hexameter, qui sine commento rimare scripta maronis immunis nuclei solo de cortica rodis. You who probe the fissures of the writings of Virgil without a commentary, gnaw or gnaw only on the bark and do not touch the piss. Gideus de Tebaldis, as we shall see, uses a different metaphor. Um, a book without a commentary remains closed. The importance of commentary is applied also to the works translated from Arabic and Greek into Latin, especially since the ancients, whether Aristotle, Hippocrates, or Ptolemy, were regarded as being obscure because of their succinctness. Uh, they were too abbreviated. And from the time of the first appearance of translations in the schools, both these languages, um, from both these languages, glosses and commentaries are mentioned. For example, in the early 13th century condemnations of the readings of Aristotle's works on natural philosophy, Aristotle is, not, is never mentioned on his own. In 1210, Pierre de Corbeil, the Archbishop of Sens, forbade the study of Aristotle and commenta in the arts faculty of the University of Paris. In 1215, the Libri Aristotelis de Metaphysica et de Naturali Philosophia and the Summae de Eistem um, were forbidden by Robert de Courson, the papal legate. Commentum, in the first quote, as we, have sh as we shall see, is a usual Latin word for commentary. The word commentarium, in fact, doesn't um, arise until the Renaissance. Summae, as I have suggested, um, is equivalent to the Arabic Jumal or Compendia, um, such as the various parts of Avicenna's Shifa. The difference between a gloss and a commentary is often dif difficult to define um, or to discern, and in Latin, at least, the terminology is rather fluid. One can differentiate them from a structural point of view. Some people have done this. A gloss is directly dependent on a text, and the glosses are usually tied to the text by a repertoire of reference marks. A commentary is usually separated, or at least separable, 
from a text, and hence has the words of the text that it comments on as lemmata um, 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 uh, with, within it. Um, so one can refer to this particular commentary as a lemmatized commentary. Hence, a collection of glosses can be called in Arabic lawahik, meaning literally appendages, as in a text by Avicenna that Roger Bacon knew as the Liber De Pendentium, the book of things hanging down from the text. <laughs> in other words, in a gloss text, the text itself is in the foreground and the glosses are dependent on it. But in the commentary, the words of the commentator are in the foreground and the text itself is subservient, sometimes reduced to initial letters of the commented phrases. But as we shall see, commentaries take several different forms. We can start off by taking a couple of texts that have already been introduced in this series. First, Adelard of Bath. As we have seen, he translated the elements of Euclid in a very literal way as part of a corpus of mathematical works leading to the study of Ptolemy's Almagest. Uh, this version is called version one of Adelard's um, Euclid. The elements were well known for following the axiomatic method of demonstration. Beginning from definitions and axioms, one can progress from simple constructions to more complex ones by a process of deduction. Already, early manuscripts of version one have glosses in the margin indicating how later theorems derive from earlier ones. For example, in manuscript Rouge 529 against elements 117, we have our pregedenti sequitur, um, our tredecima assume it. And this follows from the previous theorem. It makes an assumption from the 13th theorem. But very soon, a new version, soon after the translation, a new version of the elements came into being, attributed also to Adelard, and certainly arising amongst his um, circle, um, in which the theorems are replaced entirely by instru instructions on how to derive each of them from preceding ones. This work is set out in such a way that the definitions, postulates, axioms, and enunciations are given as the text, usually in a larger font, and the directions of proof are presented as a gloss um, or commentary to this text. And sometimes, in fact, this text, um, the definitions, etc., occur without this gloss or commentary, as indeed in the Heptateuchon of Thierry O'Chartres, which I mentioned on Tuesday. For example, for the Pythagorean theorem, elements 147, the enunciation is written in larger letters. In every right angle triangle, the square which is on the side opposite the right angle is equal to the squares inscribed on the two remaining sides. And the instructions are written in smaller font. Do this from the 13th theorem taken twice and from the third taken twice and from the 41st taken twice and twice again and draw the proof out of this. Well, you can work out how, how that, uh, but you can see that there's deduction there. Hence, this version in the manuscripts is called a commentary Incipit Geometria Euclidis ab Adelardo Batenniensi um, Commentata, or Geometria Euclidis cum Commento Adelardi. And when quoted in other texts, it was referred to as the Commentum. This, in, in fact, was the most popular version of the elements in the 12th and 13th centuries, with some 50 extant manuscripts. The classroom setting of this version is indicated by the curious marginalia which occur in some manuscripts of this version, which includes such phrases as quad propositum est adelardi patebit ingenio. What has been proposed will be clear to someone of the intelligence of Adelard. <laughs> and the statement that certain versions of the theorems or corollaries have been taken from the ocra or vallis of Regineris and other people, which I believe to be a word for the satchel. I mean, here, these are additional versions of um, theorems or, addition, uh, or corollaries. And Adelard seems to be speaking in the first person when he says, vera ergo probator esse proposito nostra absque Johannes industria. This proposition of ours is proved to be true without the hard work of Johannes. How do you interpret that? But this is not the end of the story. A later version of Euclid's Elements, called in scholarship Adelard version three, combines the instructions for proof with a full setting out of the theorem and is described as editio specialis, 
Adelardi Bathoniensis. This is the title used by Roger Bacon, who distinguishes this version from the Commentum. But uh, a Paris manuscript names Adelard both as translator and editor. Explicit editio Adelardi Bathoniensis in Geometriam Euclidis per eendum a Adelardi Adelardum um, Bathoniensem translatum. So the edition of Adelard on geometry of Euclid through the same Adelard translated. Um, this is the only version of the three attributed to Adelard that includes an introduction. This is organized according to the same list of headings, the pre consideranda, as they are called, as we find in Thierry and Gundisalinus. You remember this from last, last time and the time before. With the addition of intentio and utilitas, as a variant for Phoenix, the aim of the work, and titulus. It also shows some knowledge of the Arabic commentary on Euclid by Adnarisi, which had been translated by Gerard of Cremona, and which already shows a mixture of straight translation of the elements and demonstration of the deductive method. Finally, Campanus of Navarra, in the middle of the 13th century, produced a revision of the text which took into account the previous versions, including Anarisi's commentary, and became the standard edition for the rest of the Middle Ages. Now, um, just a little um, pictorial break. This is uh, Euclid's elements in uh, a very large uh, <coughs> manuscript of the seven liberal arts plus other things, Burney 275 in the British Library. Um, and this is just to demonstrate that we have here the theorems, or the, um, well, here the constructions, triangulum, equilaterum, um, supra, datum, lineam, um, rectam, correlocate, and that's in large, a large font. And the instruction, or the commentum, as it were, is in a smaller font, just as we would set out a work um, uh, which was commenting um, uh, where the uh, original author's um, um, right, uh, words would be in a larger font and the commentator's word, words would be in a smaller font. Now, we are lucky in the Schoenberg collection in having, well, several Euclids, in fact. Um, this is um, a, a text called the Iktisar min al makarat min kitab Euclidis, which means uh, this is uh, um, a shortened version of Euclid's elements. I mean, you can see the, uh, the various triangles and so on, which sort of prove that it is a work of geometry. You can see also um, a commentary, because shortened version, versions of things always have commentaries. Vienna, inner, so um, uh, this is that. And then so, so it uh, makes a commentary on this particular passage. Um, and here you will recognize the Pythagorean theorem from the same manuscript. Uh, um, uh, Euclid 1, 46. Um, and then there's another manuscript in the collection, which is called the Tahrir um, Euclidis. Um, and it is, a Tahrir is, um, well, indeed is a commentary or an edition, at least, um, attributed to the great 13th century, uh, 13th century mathematician um, Nasreddin Atusi. Um, and uh, it well, I mean, he was contemporary with Campanus of Navarra, and his version of Euclid's Elements became the most popular one in the Arabic world. And so popular that when it came to actually editing, or sorry, printing Arabic wor works at the end of the 16th century um, by the Medici Press, um, uh, Don Battista Raimundi was the, um, was the um, in charge. Um, it was, um, oh, sorry, there's, there's, there's the Pythagorean theorem in this particular version of Atusi, uh, but it was this version which was chosen to be printed. And I think I might have mentioned before, this press at the end of the 16th century was in fact the first press um, to systematically edit and in fact distribute um, works in Arabic, because in the Arabic world itself, printing um, didn't come until later. So we can see quite clearly, this is the book of the Tachrias, Usul, the elements of Euclid, um, uh, composed by Sir or uh, Mr. Uh, Nasir Adwin, Adwin Atusi, and we have the same thing in Latin, and published in 1594. Now, um, after Euclid, I was talking yesterday, two days ago, about Ptolemy's Armagest, and this, of course, 
was, we, we, we've already seen that um, commentaries were very common to the Armagest. Um, Stefan Georges has recently proved that a set of glosses written in the margin of Gerard of Cremona's second revision um, of his translation has been copied from the margin into three manuscripts to make it, as it were, a commentary, a lemmatized commentary. Um, its origin as a set of glosses is still apparent since, as uh, Henry Zepeda has noted in another publication, there is no introduction or overriding narrative, but the commentary retains the character of, I quote, a series of notes explaining passages in the Armagest. I mean, this just proves that the borderline between commentary and glosses is, uh, is rather vague. But if Gerard of Cremona's preferred style of interacting with translations from Arabic, um, his own translations, was, throughout, was thorough glossing, his contemporaries in Toledo adopted other approaches to the Arabic texts. Dom, uh, Dom, Domenico Gundisalvi, as we have already seen, incorporated or adapted the Arabic texts into his own original works. Not only Al-Farabi on the enumeration of the sciences into his own De Divisione Philosophiae, but also Avicenna's De Anima to his own De Anima and the Arabic philosopher's metaphysics to his own De Processione Mundi about the procession or the coming into being of the world. Gundisalvi's collaborator, John of Spain, on the other hand, wrote Latin texts that probably reflected or contributed towards the teaching of mathematical subjects in Toledo, for which he was famous, in which the Arabic, Latin, and indeed Hebrew language were mingled and exchanged. For we can find the material in his Liber Algorismi about calculation with using Indian Arabic numerals, um, and in his Liber Mahamalet, actually in, um, adopting an Arabic uh, term on business arithmetic, um, and his on the differences, de differentiis tabularum, on the differences between different various astronomical tables current in this time. Um, and we can find similarities between these works and in contemporary Maghrebi, Arabic, and Hebrew texts, without one being a translation of the other. There is one example of this material in Arabic in the Schoenberg collection, um, and it's this, um, this, this manuscript here, which contains a text entitled The Book of the Explanation and Account of the Art of the Science of the Dust. Um, that needs a bit of explanation, al-gubar. Uh, gubar is the Arabic word for dust, and the uh, huruf al-gubar were the um, letters um, of dust, and they were referring to the Hindu Arabic numerals, numerals which originated in Sanskrit, were borrowed, were taken over by the Arabs, and then were passed over to, in the West in works like the Liber Algorithmi. Um, uh, and the fact that these numbers were actually written on boards covered with a thin layer of sand. I mean, you couldn't use wax in a hot country, um, but they were sort of the equivalent of wax tablets, but using sand. So the, the numbers were called um, gubar, or sand numbers, but only, in fact, in the Western world. This is not a Western manuscript, but it must have been copied from a Western manuscript, sorry, um, 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 because we read here, these are the forms that are used amongst us, uh, and they are called the gubar. And these are the forms that are used and they're called, uh, these are forms called Al-Hindi, the numerals, the Indian numerals. Uh, and you can see they're slightly different. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Um, these are the <coughs> numbers which uh, were taken over in the West. These are the numbers which remain um, uh, the numbers used in the Arabic world. And if you look at numbering of Arabic pages, for example, you see that um, the numbers are similar to these. Um, so this is a text exactly like John of Seville's Liber Algorithmi, which tells you how to do calculations with this, a text which must have arisen in the West, in the Maghreb, um, contemporary with John of Seville, uh, or John, well, Johannes Aspanus, um, and it tells you progressively um, how to make the numbers with single digits and how to put two digits together to get tens, how to put three digits together to get hundreds, and so on. Um, the multilingual context of teaching and learning in Toledo in the 12th century, when 
this originated, and the resultant forms of the books res um, from and contributing to these t t this teaching is an area that could be should be explored further. But I would now like to go on to other contexts in which different formats uh, are found um, in the exploitation of Arabic texts. We find one of these used in the 1120s in Antioch, um, where um, Arabic learning thrived alongside Greek and lingua franca after the arrival of the Crusaders at the turn of the um, first millennium. Sorry, no, the 1100s. A certain Stephen, the philosopher, probably the treasurer of the Benedictine monastery in Antioch, um, translated Ibn al Haytham's On the Configuration of the World. This, um, taking what Eli said, this is a new uh, genre of literature which combines cosmology and, um, and astronomy, called in Arabic Ilm al Hayya, the configuration of the world. And he interleaved this with his own commentary to such an extent that when one cannot see the boundaries between the Arab's text, Ibn al Haytham's text, and his own comments. He called the whole thing the Liber Mammonis. Here we have. Uh, the, uh, there's only one manuscript from Combray, in fact, and here we have Incipit Liber Marmonis uh, in Astronomia a Stefano Philosopho Translatus. Um, so the title suggests that it is translated, but then if you look at um, the preface to the first book, you'll, uh, you'll see that Stephen is saying, in the first person, I decided to write about the circles and the heavenly spheres, etc., truthfully as I could. Um, and as the limits of the human intellect allow us to reveal, so that a path may be cleared to discover um, those circles arranged by Ptolemy in his synthesis, one of the, uh, in one of the titles for the Almagest. And as we found in the case of other scholars, the Almagest is the final aim of one's study in astronomy. Um, so he says that it is his own, and he doesn't actually refer to... Um, uh, an Arabic source until we come to the um, preface of the third of four parts, where he says, "Since oops, sorry, 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 um, uh, since in other books we followed for the most part a certain Arab, not really very com uh, complementary to um, uh, Ibn al Haytham, who was um, uh, one of the very greatest of the Arabic um, philosophers and, uh, and mathematicians." But a certain Arab, in this also we will follow him through much, though we have discovered ourselves certain things concerning the number of the spheres and the epicycles that are dissonant with what he has to say about them. So um, he's a little bit sort of niggardly in giving credit to his source here. But it has been shown quite convincingly that this text, the Liber Mammonis, um, uh, includes a very, a, quite a literal translation of the whole of Ibn al-Haytham's work. Um, but this is followed um, by commentary, you could say, or comments um, of um, Stephen of Antioch, which have been disguised. It's not obvious that they are um, comments um, that they belong to the same, um, the, the, well, as I say, the, the borderline between the Arabic and his commentary is not made clear um, Stephen himself must have translated the text and used it as a starting point for his own cosmological speculations, in which he's particularly harsh against Macrobius and the Latin tradition of cosmology. This work has just been published, in fact, by someone called uh, Dirk Gruber. Another format can be seen in Albertus Magnus's text on the movements of animals, De Motu Animalium. Albertus Magnus was not a translator himself, but he used existing translations of Aristotle's works in a very intelligent and personal way. He must have had access to an enormous number of these works, some of which no longer exist. The sadly missed leader of the Aristoteles Latinus project, Peter de Lehmans, had discovered an otherwise unknown translation of the De Motu Animalium of Aristotle from Greek, embedded like a fly in amber in the continuous text of Albertus is on account of um, uh, his account of on the movements of the animals. And you can see, and this is how um, uh, the layman actually prints, publishes the text, um, the words in, uh, in um, bold font are in fact 
the translation are in fact Aristotle's words. Um, Albertus Magnus said he discovered this translation, in fact, in Catania, um, and um, although it doesn't exist separately from this, this text of Albertus, but you can see uh, if you read this, quia igitu motorum principium est movens, uh, yes, est idem, uh, quia prima, you could get a whole, pretty well, a whole original text uh, into which uh, Albertus uh, uh, weaves his own words. And this, in fact, is his technique in dealing with any of the uh, works of Aristotle on which he writes. Um, um, well, it's hardly a commentary, but uh, he, he makes these works his own by interweaving his own words with the words of Aristotle himself. Um, and, well, to quote Peter de Lehmann's, he doesn't give Lemeter of the text, followed by commentary, but composes paraphrases into which the Aristotelian text, mutetis mutatis mutandis, is tightly interwoven. Yet another kind of commentary is the refutation, um, a particularly um, prominent Arabic genre, in fact, called a rad in Arabic, or shukuk, which just means problems about, shukuk ala jardinus, is problems about what she, what 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 Galen what Galen said, um, and um, uh, and uh, we have titles like the Islah, um, the correction of another author's work. This is the case with um, a Spar well, an Andalusi author of the 12th century called Jabir ibn Afla, who wrote an Islah al Majisti, corrections to the Almagests, which picks up statements of Ptolemy. Um, in quid Ptolemaeus, followed by a statement, um, and as the auctor, he refutes them or he corrects them. Um, and you can see this from another manuscript in the Schoenberg collection. Actually, we have the Latin translation made by Gerard of Cremona of this Isca al Magisti. And I think you can see, and from these mistakes uh, in which he eravit, in which Ptolemaeus made a mistake, and et eravit et eravit, et eravit, et eravit, et eravit, and et eravit, and there are 14 eravit, in <laughs> fact. So, um, so the whole um, book is built on, is constructed on these errors of Ptolemy, um, which he's trying to correct. And uh, on one page, I think it's actually the next page here. Uh, yes, sorry, I'm looking too, too far. Um, uh, we have a nice uh, diagram of planetary movement there with the eccentric and the epistyle phases there. Um, but somewhere here, we can see Ptolemy's, yes. Um, Quam firmare non potest. One cannot be, be, be establish this uh, on a firm foundation. Um, uh, quoniam uh, textus, sermonis Ptolemei destruit. So the text actually contradicts what he intended to, um, to, to set out to say, to set out to say. So um, it's, it, it, sometimes the language is rather intemperate as well. Um, the, yeah. Um, now, after all these rather curious variations, I should like to go on um, to the introduction of commentaries themselves. So, what we might recognize more clearly as commentaries into the West. I'm not suggesting that the form itself was new to the West. Boethius provided fine examples of both the Platonic kind of commentary, his first commentary to Porphyry's Disagoge, um, which is a conversation, as we discovered in the first lecture, um, and what one might call the Alexandrian commentary, whose form is particularly linked with Ammonius Saccas at the end of the fifth century. This form, as exemplified in Boethius, consists of an introduction, after which is given a portion of the text, usually between 50 or 200 uh, and 250 words, sometimes to note its position in the argument, which we might call, or they called in the Middle Ages, a continuatio, and then to explain it in length, at length. The Arabs also inherited the Alexandrian tradition. Ibn al-Nadim in the 10th century lists all the commentaries on Aristotle that were known to him. And Averroes in the later 12th century was still aware of many of these, especially, and the, well, he used especially those of Alexander of Aphrodisias 
Antimistius, the, the latter being more a paraphrase than a commentary. In medicine, in turn, there were copious commentaries of Galen on Hippocrates. In fact, this was the most common vehicle for the text of Hippocrates, and where the text of Hippocrates appears on its own, it has, as likely as not, been excerpted from Galen's commentary. Some of these commentaries were transmitted from Arabic into Latin. The commentary of Themistius, or the paraphrase of Themistius on the posterior analytics, and Galen's commentaries on Hippocrates' treatment of acute diseases and on Hippocrates' aphorisms and prognostics. This is what Galen's commentary on Hippocrates' regimen of acute diseases looks like in the 13th century manuscript, now in Uppsala, in fact. Um, you can see uh, it's a very uh, obvious um, um, format. These are the words of Hippocrates in a larger font. In Tupit Liber Hippocrates, the Regimine um, Acutarum, <coughs> the regimen how to, how to treat someone who suffers from acute disease. Um, then, in fact, we have a second translation, which is uh, underlined in red here. This is probably the translation directly from Greek. This is from Arabic. Or, well, it's more likely the Latin here, actually. And this is Galen's commentary translated from Arabic which um, uh, uh, is likely to have been, well, the translation is likely to have been by Constantine the African and then revised by Gerard of Cremona. But the next one is actually from the um, Schoenberg um, collection. Again, it's just a single leaf, which you can see was um, originally or came from the binding of a book of some sort. You can see the, uh, the part to tucked in. Um, at the side, from the top and the bottom. And you have a, a commentary by Galen on Hippocrates, that aphorisms, aphorisms had to be commented on because they were totally obscure um, if they were just left as they were. So um, we have this commentary on um, the aphorism that if a, if a woman is subjected to purgations, then it's likely, you know, it's possible, impossible, but impossible for the uh, embryo to survive, to be healthy. Um, and we have a lot of extra commentaries here, including a long section from Aristotle's um, Problemata on the same subject. So we have this repertoire of commentaries um, originating in ancient Greece, um, uh, uh, transmitted in um, Arabic and passed on to the Latins. In the Western world, after Boethius, there is a lull in writing philosophical or scientific commentaries. I mean, we have plenty of commentaries on the books of the Bible, um, uh, you know, theological commentaries, but not on scientific works. And this lull lasts until the early 12th century, precisely the time when commentaries were starting to be translated from Arabic. Then, in the first half of the 12th century, there was suddenly a great number of commentaries, especially those written on logical works. John Marenbon, a leading figure in this area, identifies the following types. A continuous commentary, which is either a literal commentary, um, Peter Abelard uses the, 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 the term glossolai for this, um, or, or a problem or, or question commentary, or a composite commentary, which combined word-for-word -word exegesis, exegesis um, the philological commentary, with a wider examination of the issues raised. The purely Latin tradition, therefore, had a rich variety of commentaries. It didn't need to borrow this genre from the Arabs. Arabic authors, in turn, commented on Greek works, such as the extensive commentaries of Al-Farabi and Ibn Bajah on Aristotle's philosophical works, and Nairisi's commentary on Euclid's elements, which I've already mentioned, and Ali ibn Ridwan's commentaries on Galen's techni, um, a very large medical text, and Ptolemy's Tetrabibros, and above all, those of Averroes. All these commentaries, except Ibn Bajas, were translated into Latin. One can take examples of Arabic commentaries that were transmitted into Latin and see how, if at all, the Arabic text affected the form and style of the Latin. First, I shall look at the commentary on Ptolemy's Tetrabibros, his great work on astrology, the classical work on astrology by Ali ibn Ridwan. Ibn Ridwan was a learned doctor of the 11th century in Zirid, North Africa. He died in 1061. And as well as being well known for observing a supernova in 1006, he wrote an extensive commentary on Galen's Techni, 
um, which could have been the last work translated by Gerald of Cremona, since it was to the end of this commentary, um, his translation of this commentary, the, that the list of his translations was added by his students, his Sokii. But Ibn Ridwan also wrote this commentary on the Tetrabibros, which was translated into Castilian in the court of Alfonso X, in, uh, King 1256 to 84, and subsequently translated into Latin by Egidius de Tebaldis. We do not have the intermediary Castilian version, but we have both uh, manuscripts, uh, fine manuscripts of the Arabic text and of the um, Latin text, Latin translation. And if you just look back to the Arabic text here, we see in rubric to Exteria, Bakhtar al-Ulla, um, um, in Tafsir, the first uh, thesis or first book of the Tafsir, which is now the Greek commentary of Hassan Ali um, ibn Ridwan, uh, ibn Ali ibn um, Jafar um, al-Tabib, so it's quite a long name, but uh, his last, his last word just means the doctor. Um, and of course, it's he, um, um, al-Ulla, al al-Ulla, al al min kitab al-Arba'a, which is the Arabic word for the partition, li batanus, the Arabic word for Ptolemy. Um, and it's very nicely written. This is a manuscript from the Astoria. And then when we look at this um, uh, Latin um, version, we have Dixit, Egidius de Tebaldis, Lombardos de Tilicate Paramenti. So he um, is a Lombard from the city of Parma. And this corresponds exactly to the um, Arabic, because the translation from Arabic into Castilian was very literal, and the translation from Castilian into Latin again was literal. Um, so, um, the first printed version, uh, we, we, this was also, this also saw um, printing in the Renaissance, um, exhibits a form that is particular to commentaries, um, translated from another language, or translated from Arabic, in that um, each textus, the textus is the passage from the original author, uh, the text is what is commented, um, is given twice. First, in um, a previous translation, so for this Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos, it would be the translation by Plato of Tivoli of 1136, and then in the translation as it is embedded in the commentary. Um, so in this case, the translation of the Castilian, of the Arabic, um, by um, uh, um, uh, Egidius de Tebaldis. And we shall see other examples of this. Um, it's, qu it's quite common, in fact. Um, this very popular work called the Centiloquium of Pseudo-Ptolemy was translated some five times in the 12th century, and many manuscripts have two or, or even three of these five versions as the textus, followed by the commentary of Ahmad ibn Yusuf. Another feature that is, of course, peculiar to translations is that one may have both a translator's and an author's preface to the text. In the case of this Ibn Ridwan, we have a substantial preface by Egidius de Tabaldist himself, in which he explains how necessary it is to write a commentary, since, I quote, here we are, um, his, Ptolemy's words, are so closed up and so weighty in their meaning that they can scarcely be prized open, you know, like an oyster, I suppose, by any wise man, but rather almost all people will err, will make mistakes in them so that the Tetrabibros might lie open more clearly to those who study its meaning, I have decided to translate from Spanish into plain and open, he repeats this word, Latin, the book itself with the glosses of the most wise Ibn Ridwan, the doctor, who owed to God on the one side and to his own um, um, powers of intuition that he could understand the words themselves and whatever Ptolemy meant by them by the order and wish of Lord Alfonso, Alfonso, the famous king of the Romans and of Castile. Uh, in fact, the rest of the preface is um, a praise of his patron, um, King Alfonso. Then follows the preface of Ibn Ridwan himself. I've given a little bit of that at the bottom there, um, Ibn Ridwan, um, um, in which um, he also points out the necessity for making a commentary because Ptolemy's language is so compressed. This, as, as I have said, is uh, commonly said concerning ancient Greek authors. 
but the main part of the preface is taken up with the topics that have to be addressed before embarking on the book itself. I mean, these have become familiar to you all now. And the familiar headings, the reasons why the book, uh, about which the book speaks, which turns out to be the intention of the book, the name of the book, the benefits in what order should be read, the name of the author, about what art is it, and how many parts does it have, and finally, in what way does it demonstrate what is in it. So the method followed in the book by the author. And each of these is described in detail. And then the uh, um, preface of Ibn Nidran ends, but after we have completely spoken about these principal eight things, we wish to begin to gloss the words of Ptolemy, putting his words on one side and our gloss, gloss on the other in such a way that it is well divided. This, of course, is a translation of the Latin. If you go to the Arabic of Ibn Ridwan, you'll see that he says something rather similar, but not quite the same. He says, so we take um, in our um, commentary the word of Ptolemy, um, and we read his word um, on its own, or we make sure that it's read on its own, um, so that the um, consideration of it is clearer at Khmal, uh, with the help of God. Um, so he's just emphasizing that you extract the words of Ptolemy so that it's quite clear what they are, and then the commentary follows um, each of these passages that have been extracted. It is noticeable that the Latin translator consistently uses the noun glosa and the verb glosare um, in this um, commentary, these two prefaces, let's say. Um, but commentum is used for the title in some, at least some of the manuscripts. And the comments follow the textus of following the textus of Ptolemy are called commenta. I think you can see here, yes. This is a manuscript um, from, as you can see, from Vienna. Um, here's the very beginning, the capital of primum primi tractatus libri quati partium Ptolemy. So the first chapter of the first um, uh, book of the book which is called, of the book of Ptolemy is called the Quadripartitum. It's strange that he uh, underlined or expunged um, um, quality and put a, an Arabic numeral four on top there. And these are the words of Ptolemy. This should be a P. Uh, this is a mistake. It should be a blue P. And it says, Reis misor equibus um, uh, ficiuntur pre pro dossipationes accepte de astronomia maiores et majores. And QA, so this is the words of Ptolemy saying that amongst astronomical prognostics, there are two parts. This is repeated, in fact, in a and maybe a second translation in Russian here, but you can see it's a commentum primum, and throughout the work you'll have commentum secundum, commentum tertium, and so on. And then you have, and this is just, this is just a, a, an interesting thing, um, you have another quotation by, written in the same hand, as you can see, uh, where Abraham, Judeo sapiens de Toledo, and this, uh, is this wise Jew from Toledo, um, um, dixit quod hoc, Quod dictitur halli, of course, sorry, quod dicit halli est veritas. Well, I mean, why, why bother to say that if you, um, if you think that, as he thought, that what Halley said, which is in his commentary, Halley in Midwan, um, is, is actually true. So, you know, he's um, just sort of repeating what Halley says. But this Abraham and Judeus we know of as one of the translators working in the court of Alfonso X. Um, now, um, if I think there's another, yes, I'm just putting side by side um, the commentum um, in Arabic of Ibn Ridwan and the commentum in Latin. You can get a nice manic uh, manipulum there, manipulum, um, which I gather is the symbol for the um, Kislat Center, or yes, and not this particular one, but, um, <laughs> but you can see Carla Batlemus, so uh, Ptolemy said, and this is a quotation from. And the Septuagint the Gloss, and then Scala Mufassia, so that is, and the commentator um, said. And here, uh, the equivalent in Latin, you always have a P, uh, that's why I said the other one should be a P, for Ptolemaeus. These are the words of Ptolemaeus, these are the words of Ptolemaeus. And then the red para indicates the words of the commentator, which, uh, well, it doesn't actually put a letter for the commentator, but it's quite clear what the difference between the and the words. And one thing to point out is that in this case, 
um, the actual font, if you like, of the, com of the uh, commentary is exactly the same as that of the words of the author himself. No distinction is made. You don't have a new paragraph. You don't have any indentation or a smaller font for the commentary. Um, so this is one, um, one way in which the Latin commentary actually um, corresponds with the original Arabic commentary. Another thing uh, which might or might not be true is that Ibn Ridwan tends to use the first and the second person in his commentary. He says, I have glossed these words for you, which you should study and apply your mind to, and may God direct you onto the straight path. I mean, that's a quotation from the um, Quran in fact. And then he has this throwaway sentence, if you have understood well what Ptolemy said before, you will not need a commentary. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just wonder whether this use of first and second person rather than third person, Ptolemy says, or it is said here, whatever, is a particularly Arabic feature. Uh, you could probably give many counter examples to that. Ibn Ridwan's commentary in the Latin translation conforms in its style and mise en page to a long commentary of Averroes. Four of these are known from their medieval translations into Latin, physics, de Caelo, metaphysics, and de anima, so they're all on natural science and metaphysics. These share the same vocabulary and terminology in Latin and are evidently the work of a single translator. This translator is identified as Michael Scott, who died in 1236, so sometime early in the 13th century, since the translation of De Caelo is explicitly attributed to him. Um, a detailed analysis of Dag Nikolaus Hasse has shown that Michael Scott translated literally, but missed out passages which were only understandable to a Muslim or to an inhabitant of Muslim lands. Only the metaphysics is found almost complete in Arabic. One third of the text of the De Cairo commentary survives in Tunis, and recently some fragments of the long commentary on the De Anima have been identified significantly as marginal notes um, in Hebrew script, but Arabic, your Judeo Arabic, to the Hebrew translation um, of the middle commentary. Um, and since the metaphysics is complete, I just give you a couple of um, examples of this. This is a manuscript from Leiden. Um, for some reason, it's got a Greek title there, uh, the Hermeneia, of course, the Greek word for the commentary, Esomata Physica. Um, you have the Bismillah um, Rahman Rahim, the Greek word, um, beginning of an Arabic uh, Muslim title up there. You have Ilm Mabad al Habia, so the wisdom or the knowledge of what is past the physics, and so on. And, and so on. Um, in fact, this is a slight, it's a short preface which seems to have been covered together from prefaces from two of the later books of the metaphysics and describe in particular um, um, the divisions of the book and what you find in each of the 13 or the 15 books of the metaphysics. Um, but the, the actual commentary um, begins here on the Ursa page. Um, and uh, the Arabic version of the metaphysics was slightly different in order from the Greek version. At the beginning of the metaphysics, you have alpha uh, meson and alpha elaton, the bigger alpha and the smaller alpha. And the smaller alpha starts, um, the, the Arabic starts with the smaller alpha. And the second book of the Arabic is the greater alpha. And it also misses out a couple of books later on in the metaphysics. But um, here we have the beginning. Um, uh, you can just refer to the Praise to God and so on. Um, and then you have Qala Aristati Aristotelis, so Aristotle said, and then later down here you have um, Al um, Tafsir. Um, instead of having the Mufassir, which you had before in Ibn Idran, which means the commentator, here we have the commentary. And so this is where the commentary begins. And you notice again that um, the commentary is not separated. Uh, either by the font or by paragraphs or whatever from the rest of the text. It's continuous text. And this is what you find occasionally in the, well, in the early, let's say in the early Latin um, translations of the long commentaries, 
Here we have the beginning of the commentary on the physics, incipit commentum, um, aver, uh, short for avere, so averish, Spaniard cordialensis, that's the Averish Spaniard who came from Cordoba, super libro physicorum, uh, and then I think that's in Gideon and Aristoteles. Um, yeah, the Greek, Lycia, Stradivite, should be um, um, Philip Aristoteles, uh, basically, that's the uh, death of the um, uh, the philosophers, the Aristotle from Stagira. Um, and the other, and sorry, you can say, so this, we launch straight into the words of Aristotle here. I mean, this is what one thing I want to emphasize here. No preface, um, and no introduction at all. You will launch straight into the words of Aristotle, and then the commentary of other scholars. And this is the same both in the Arabic, as I've just shown you, and in the Latin. And this is also the same um, in the long commentary on the soul. Um, here we have a different format, though, and the actual words of Aristotle are in a larger size. Um, the commentary on Averroes is in a smaller font, and so on. And because of this um, difference of font, it's not even necessary to say av, that this is Averroes, um, or and, uh, ar, this is Aristotle, because it's quite clear. Um, and each, well, it should be clear by now, each of these um, passages from Aristotle is a commentum, and so when we're referring to these long commentaries, um, we are referring to a book, and then we're referring to a particular commentum, comment, uh, commentum 33 or commentum 46 or whatever. Um, this manuscript, which um, is from um, Prague, in fact, is interesting in that we actually have line numbers, which is rather unusual in a, um, in a medieval manuscript. Um, well, so what I'm saying is that uh, we don't find in the Latin translations any sort of preface in the long commentaries, nor does Michael Scott um, add prefaces. Um, so this is very different from the commentary of Ibn Ridwan, which has two prefaces, that of um, Ibn Ridwan himself and that of the translator Idilius de Valdis. Um, the long commentary on the De Caelo is the only long commentary in Latin which has a preface at all, Michael Scott's four-line dedication to Etienne de Provence. This is followed simply by a 16-line précis of the contents of the work, i.e. the Divisio Libri, which could well be Michael's addition. Um, and he says, you know, in the first treaties of this book, there are seven large summae, um, uh, the first about the substances of this art, the second about the definition of a natural body, um, and that it is alone, that it alone is complete, and the mundus is alone complete among bodies, and etc. Um, and this is again similar to that, add what I call the added preface to the, Ar to the Arabic um, long commentary on the uh, metaphysics. The lack of a preface introducing the book, its author, the circumstances of its writing and the headings is conspicuous in these commentaries. One would have expected the kind of preface, as I say, um, that we see in Ibn Ridwan's commentary, um, um, which otherwise presents a very similar format to Averroes long commentaries. But there could be an explanation for this lack, for the long commentary on the physics, um, the first book of the series of books on natural science, of which like De Caelo, De Anima, our later volumes, and which, of course, precedes the metaphysics, a substantial preface does exist. Again, the Arabic has not been discovered, but there are Hebrew and Latin translations made in the 13th century. The preface to the physics does contain what you might expect to find in a preface. Um, uh, sorry, we could go on to... My intention in this essay is to gloss the book of Aristotle, which is called the physics. So here we are, yes. Um, uh, because the gloss of none of the expositors treats each and every word of Aristotle, nor is the explanation of each word given by Alexander except, um, extant except on part of the first, the second, fourth, fifth, and seventh book. Um, but first I will mention, Averroes says, according to the usage of glossators speaking at the beginning of the work, eight headings. And so again, we have these headings. Um, the intention, the, um, the usefulness, the order, the division of the subject matter, the relation method of teaching the name of the book, the name of the author. 
Um, and then he says, although many more things can be understood from the proemium of a book, we shall show in what follow, um, as we shall show in what follows. And in fact, the whole preface is built on these eight um, headings, ru'us in Arabic, sometimes called circumstantiae in Latin. Um, under the heading of the name of the book, Avaro is said that this book is the principle and root of the whole of this art, and the part is called by the name of the whole, because it is potentially every part, just as an element is potentially the element of whatever is generated from it. So one could imagine, therefore, that this preface could serve as an introduction to the whole series of long commentaries. It's a part for the whole. Although it only mentions the immediately following work, which is on physics or natural hearing. What is strange, however, is the history of this preface. There is, of course, no evidence of it in Arabic. In the Latin tradition, it is not translated along with the other commentaries um, by Michael Scott. Rather, if we trust a notice in one manuscript of the Latin translation uh, from Erfurt, it was asked for by students um, of Padua University from Theodore, um, it's Domes Prohemium Commenti Averroes, Super Libro Physicorum Aristoteles, Quod Transtulit Magister Theodorus Rogatu Scholarium Qui Erant Padue. These students evidently felt the lack of such a preface. If this Theodore was the same person as the philosopher of Frederick II, who translated works on falconry for the emperor, he would have known the long commentaries translated by his colleague, Michael Scott, and would have lived until shortly before Frederick II's death in 1250. But Theodore's translation was not immediately um, added to the long commentary. In fact, of the 80 or so Latin manuscripts of the long commentary on the physics, very few uh, um, include this preface. The detachment, or rather unattachment, of the preface may also be due to the very fact that the long commentaries are so closely attached to Aristotle's text. Only what Averroes had to say about the individual words of Aristotle was relevant. These comments should be and could be substantial, but any material which was not attached to Aristotle's words was regarded, might have been regarded as superfluous. This led to the situation that the commentary could hardly be said to have been given even a title of its own. The present editors, in fact, um, uh, consulted with them of the commentary on the physics and the commentary on the metaphysics, say there is no title because the commentary is just what we find attached to the uh, Aristotle's text. Um, we do have one manuscript, one of, very few, one of the very few manuscripts that transmits the preface, that attempts to construct a well-ordered corpus of Aristotle's works with Averroes' commentaries. This manuscript is in, was copied in 1243 in Milan, so a very early date, really, and it starts with the preface to the physics. Um, and this has been brought into service for introducing the whole of Aristotle's natural philosophy. It ends, um, do I have this? Yes. Um, sorry, it will be coming on to this. We must now pass over to explaining the words of the book, meaning of physics, but he goes on to say, in this volume are contained the commentaries, commenta of Averroes, the Spaniard from Cordova, the famous commentator of the books of natural physics and metaphysics, or first physics on our, um, of Aristotle, the Greek Stagirite, the most outstanding of the peripatetics. I mean, this is a film familiar um, way of describing both Averroes and Aristotle. Complete, perfect, corrected, illuminating both universals and particulars of each kind of physics. And then we have the works of Aristotle following in canonical order, some of which are accompanied by the long commentaries, some of which are substituted by middle commentaries, and occasionally, as in the case of the De Animalibus, we just have Aristotle's text in no commentary. What we see here is a gallant attempt in Milan in mid-13th century to put together a corpus from what was available, a general preface, even though it was only for a specific work, and a mixture of long um, commentaries and middle commentaries. So to recapitulate, the long commentaries of Averroes can be seen to follow the late Hellenic tradition of writing word-for-word -word commentaries on Aristotle, of which the Arabs were the inheritors. Boethius had drawn upon this same tradition in his commentaries on these logical works, but these covered only the, yes, only the field of logic, 
With the translation of these Arabic commentaries into Latin in the early 13th century, the tradition for word-for-word -word commentaries on the rest of Aristotle's works was introduced into the Latin world. Aside from being copied in numerous manuscripts, Averroes' commentary was, as has already been mentioned, incorporated in, so, uh, probably not, uh, it was incorporated into standard glosses to the text. Um, and I'll just give you an example of this. You don't have to read this, um, but this is a famous uh, manuscript, uh, RE3487 from the British Library. This is the beginning of the great, sorry, this is the beginning of Aristotle's text on physics. And you have two columns on each side, um, which are dedicated to commentary. And in fact, most, almost all of this commentary here is from Aristotle, from Averroes, um, introduced by a, a big C for commentator. This is what Averroes has to say. This is what we call, in fact, the Oxford gloss because it's uh, repeated in several manuscripts written in Oxford in the late 13th century and early 14th century. And um, it includes all, more than two thirds of the commentary of Averroes. So we really have another manuscript or many other manuscripts um, of Averroes commentary cut up and put into the margin of the text. And of course, if you have that form of commentary, you don't have to have a title to Averroes. You don't have to have a preface. Um, uh, so as, uh, as I have hinted, the long commentary, in spite of its length, was not sufficient in itself. At least the students of Padua in the mid 13th century did not think so. They needed an introduction. And in fact, where you find a more discursive, reflective, and introductory piece of writing from Averroes is in his so-called middle commentaries. I must just say, um, as an aside, the term middle commentaries and long co commentaries is an invention of the Renaissance. These commentaries were never known as long or middle or even short. In the Middle Ages, they were simply commenta. The middle commentaries are not lemmatized word-for-word -word commentaries. In fact, one might question whether they are commentaries at all in the strict sense. In Arabic, a different word is used. While the long commentaries are called tafsir, explanation, originating, as they say, in commentaries on the Quran, expositio would probably be a better translation in Latin, but commentum is used most frequently. The middle commentaries are talhis, or summaries, but that they are taking a step back to observe the work of Aristotle from the outside, as it were, is indicated by the very language of the works. Characteristic of their opening is the phrase, the aim of this work, or the aim of this work of mine, is to explain. You have the intentio at the very beginning there, garad in Arabic. Um, and have I quoted something? Yes, for example, this is William of Luna's translation of a middle commentary of one of the logical texts, the categories. Um, uh, uh, um, and he says, as we see, the aim of this work is to explain the opinions contained in the books of Aristotle and the art of logic and take them over as far as we can practically do so for the rest of his books, beginning from the first book in this art. Similar phrase, uh, phrases occur at the beginning of the middle commentary of the De Generatione, Corruptione, Intentio Nostra in hoc libro est quod opported de determinare, and the Poetria Intentio Nostra est in hoc editione determinare. I mean, we, we know from the very beginning of these lectures how important Intentio was as the first of the headings. We find a similar phrase at the beginning of Averroes medical text known as the Collegret, Intentio mea in hoc tractatu est tradere in arte medicina, summas, my intention in this treatise is to transmit summai, in the jumal word, in the art of medicine. Um, now, intentio, as will be familiar to us now, is the first of the headings, as, as I've just said. And it is in these middle commentaries that we find a discussion of other headings, such as the order of teaching, the division of the book. The middle commentaries regularly add a preface before launching into the subject itself. Um, hints um, in the text indicate that the long commentaries are involved in demonstration, i.e. demonstrating what the words of Aristotle really mean. But the middle commentaries are rather a narration. You have the title, the phrase in Latin, per via narrationis. They simply describe what's going on. The phrase intentio est in hoc libro is picked up by Thomas Aquinas in his commentary to the De Anima and Adam of Buckfield in his commentaries um, to Aristotle's works, Intentio Mea in Hoc Ceremone. Both Thomas and Adam were very early, were early users of Averroes' Ar works, so they probably got the idea from that. So I'm just finishing now. I'm sorry to go on a bit long. So the middle commentaries complement the long commentaries, and ideally, 
Both kinds of commentary should be read in tandem with each other. The, the, um, uh, the Paris manuscript that I've just mentioned and drew on middle commentaries and long commentaries, but did not provide more than one commentary to one work of Aristotle. It is only when we come to the great edition of, I quote, all the extant works of Aristotle, and we have yeah, all the extant works of Aristotle and all the commentaries of Averroes that we have come down, that have come down to us, published by the Jonta brothers in Venice in 11 volumes in 1550 to 1552, that we have epitomes, middle commentaries, and long commentaries on the same works. Um, and this is thanks to the fact that the editors of this wonderful volume, or series of volumes, were able to draw on the new translations of Averroes made from Hebrew into Latin from the late 15th century onwards, and commissioned further translations from Hebrew um, by Jacob um, Mancinus. And you can see here, um, you can read this in your leisure, but here we have, um, uh, although um, some have not come down to Latin, but recently have been translated, conversely, by Jacob Mancinus, uh, of course, always from Hebrew. So, um, um, uh, in this series of, yes, yeah, so, so the commentary has reached its ac acme in this series of volumes. As uh, we have some epitomies, but we have many middle commentaries and long commentaries. Um, Ac Aristotle's notoriously elliptical and difficult to comprehend words are now fully explained and totally clear. I hope you will, uh, uh, um, I hope you will admit. So, like Boethius and his friends who spent the night in the middle of winter in the Aurelian Mountains just north of Rome, commenting on Porphyry's introduction to logic and paused when the first light of dawn appeared on the horizon, so may we, having discussed other commentaries and at least having arrived at some sort of dawn of understanding, now take a rest. Thank you very much. Hi, so thank you so much for the series of lectures. So I was interested in the heading of the name of the author, or the intention of the author. Yes, yes. And I was wondering, kind of where do these Arab translators and commentators fit into a notion of authorship within this heading? And then also I was struck by um, Tabaldus's preface uh, to the Ibn Ridwan commentary on uh, Ptolemy and the role that Ibn Ridwan played as kind of completing Ptolemy and actually making Ptolemy more readily understandable. Yeah. And is there kind of a notion of, well, authorship for Ibn Ridwan there, but also a notion of scientific progress that's embedded in that? Is Ibn Ridwan filling out something that Ptolemy didn't have? Uh, well, there, there are at least three questions. <laughs> um, authorship, I think people, I mean, it's probably trendy to say that uh, um, the idea of author was, didn't exist sort of in the Middle Ages, you know. Um, I think, uh, well, the subtlety of the um, position of the author is very well described by Alistair Minnis in a, in a, in a notion of the idea of authorship in the Middle Ages. But, um, but in these cases, it is a really important matter as to whether the name which is attached to a work really should be there. Uh, is the book really the book, um, the, the, the work of the author whose name is there, who's, to whom it is attributed? Um, and then the idea, as I've said before, of, um, of the, the students of Gerard to make sure that Gerard's name does appear on all his translations, people know what he translated, and does, does show that authorship is important. Um, as for um, progress, well, all I can say is that um, uh, we have as a kind of liturgy this phrase, 
um, the Greeks were just too succinct. They, um, uh, well, in fact, uh, especially in the um, preface of Thomas or Junta to this wonderful uh, edition here, he says the Greeks just um, were, were, were too, too succinct, and the Greek commentators didn't even explain what they said. So we have to go to the Arabs, and especially Averroes, um, to have a complete explanation of what they said and what they meant. Uh, the, um, of course, the um, exception to this was Galen, who was always uh, criticized for being too prolix. And in that case, you had to, um, you, you had to abbreviate him. Um, so uh, Ibn Ridwan, I mean, he's not claiming to be any a better astronomer, astrologer than Ptolemy. He's just saying that, you know, he can, uh, he has this intuition. I mean, I, I thought it was rather strange, well, interesting that um, Tebaldi should say he, he was um, dependent on God, but also dependent on his own intuition in knowing, in spite of not being able to read Greek, what Ptolemy actually meant in his Tetrapiblos. But this is a very complicated uh, question uh, about you know, authority, but um, I think there's no doubt that there was um, an aim to find out exactly um, who wrote. And, uh, and if you knew that it was indeed Ptolemy who wrote this, then his, his authority was so great that you had to listen to what he had to, to write. You, you were going to say something to that, Rita? No? <laughs> because, of course, Rita also has written a lot about authority. Mm. Thank you for another great talk. Um, uh, you, I, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about the intellectual communities involved in the background of all of this. So um, you had this one passage, I think it was Michael Scott uh, commenting on I don't remember what, um, but he was mentioning that the other commentaries didn't comment on every single word, and so implication, mine is better. But I, I was just, I was thinking of that in comparison to, you mentioned texts had multiple translations. And yeah. so how should we think about those multiple translations? Are those co individuals or communities that have no contact with each other? And so each, you know, each of those translations is necessary because nobody has one? or are they comparative? Do you see in these prefaces, you know, that translation wasn't good enough and we are closer to the truth now with yes. this one? Well, again, two or three questions there, but um, uh, the main thing to bear in mind is that people weren't reading the original language. And the only way they could get to Aristotle or to Ptolemy or to Galen and so on was to compare different translations. And the more translations you had, the more likely you were to get to exactly what Galen said or what Aristotle said. And this is said quite explicitly by some. And Albertus Magnus, you see, was a great philosopher, great scientist, um, but he didn't, know, you know, he didn't know the languages. But very often he would say, according to the Arabic translation, the translation from Arabic is this, but according to the translation from Greek, it is this, and we have to decide which is more likely. Um, and, uh, and as you uh, hint, the, the translators often were in competition with each other, and they said, you know, my translation is better than the translation of um, James of Vedis or the translation of Constantine the African. Um, but, uh, the, but that said, it was important that there should be more than one translation, um, especially if the two translations were from different languages, from Greek and Arabic. Thank you so much for all these uh, talks. They've been really illuminating. Um, I wanted to ask, I have many questions, but I'll just ask one. Um, so there's a famous instance of William of Conch mm. in his commentary, his glossa yes. on Plato, yes. making glossa yes. the strong term, yes. a term that's stronger than commentum, yes. because he says the glossa can talk, essentially the glossa can be not just content, but form, word, philology, it can do everything. Yes. And so yes. I wonder to what, to what extent, so it's a reasonable distinction that he makes, although it's pretty perverse, because yes. in fact, for the most part, glossa is just a little yes. thing that you stick in, <laughs> you know, whereas commentum is the big 
and, and, and rather grand yes. form. Yes. But to what extent do the scientific commentaries yes. also take it as their job to comment at a verbal, formal, stylistic, or simply philological level to the extent that they will rephrase something. So what William McConch will do when he's reading Plato or when he's reading Christian is he will rephrase it so that you will understand what the text means. To what extent do, do these scientific texts pay attention to that level, or are they really interested in content doctrine? Well, as we saw with that um, Melbourne manuscript that, yesterday, that you yes. know, Sorry. By a combination of commentary, yeah. of Levitite's commentary, interlinear yes, comments yeah, yeah. on particular yeah. words, um, and um, multiplied by two or three, you know, you, you got everything. Um, uh, I think, um, um, uh, I just wonder whether you do have a similar situation in, say, the Dragmaticon or something, where you have interlinear explanations, or, well, in, in Virgil or whatever, where you have interlinear um, explanations of single words as well as a more discursive right. comment. Although I think what William McConch is talking about is that the single commentator yes. does all of this himself. Yes. It's not that it's simply available on the page no. layout, no. but that it's the work of one commentator yes. who yes. attends to all of these things from the yes. individual words yes. and, and their philological value yes. to the doctrinal content. You did have one example, a wonderful example, and now I'm forgetting, was it Michael Scott who said, I think it was Michael Scott who said, S I pay attention to every single word. I, mm. I, I, mm. I focus on every single word. But I wondered, is you, he interested yes, yes. at all mm. in the, if you like, grammatically? I mean, does he explain what, what goes on grammatically? Well, we have an example, Gerald Cremona, where he says this is the a nominative, this is the accusative in Arabic, that's, this yeah, is the genitive. Yeah, you know. that's, um, yeah. Uh, no, Gerard Cremona certainly um, uh, does. And I was just thinking of, um, what's it, Ungo um, Benz, um, um, Umberto Benz, in his commentary on Avicenna. He spent a whole paragraph just examining what the, what the proper name Ibn Sina means, mm -hmm. and, and Abu Ali, his other name, you see. Um, and he was well, very curious about um, you know, words and their etymology. <laughs> you know? so, um, so I think you find, you find both, yes, yes, yes.